during the sermon. So this morning's scripture reading always makes me think of that well-known and well-loved church joke, which I will now tell forthwith. During worship, the minister gathered all the children around him and gave, there's a, there was a boy minister at that church, uh, gathered all the children around him and gave a brief lesson before sending them off to church school. On this particular Sunday, he was using squirrels for an object, not actual ones. He was going to talk about squirrels as an object lesson on industriousness and preparation. He started out by saying, I'm going to describe something and I want you to raise your hand when you know what it is. Some of you know exactly where this is going. The children nodded eagerly. The thing I'm thinking about lives in trees and eats nuts. No hands went up. Okay, it's gray and it has a long bushy tail. The children were looking at each other, but still no hands were raised. Okay, said the minister, it, it jumps from branch to branch. It uh, chatters and flips its tail when it's excited. Finally, one little boy tentatively raised his hand. The pastor breathed a sigh of relief and called on him. Well, said the boy, I know the answer's got to be Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel. <laughs> Guys, that's an old one. Come on. <laughs> Pages, or passages rather like this one from Jeremiah and our passage from two weeks ago from Isaiah often send our mind racing to Jesus before stopping to actually listen to what's being described. That is, sometimes we fall into the trap of understanding the Old Testament only through the lens of Jesus. Even though it's got a bushy tail and jumps from branch to branch, it's got to be Jesus, right? Now, in fairness to us, it's not completely wrong, since Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. My point is just that sometimes we're so focused on finding and seeing Jesus in the Old Testament texts that we fail to let the text stand on its own two feet. So, spoiler alert, Jeremiah was not describing Jesus of Nazareth, son of God, son of Mary, as we know and understand him. Yes, he was making reference to God's promise to King David that a descendant of his household would always sit on the throne. And yes, he was alluding to God's Messiah, the one who will be called the Lord's righteousness. But Jeremiah, the man languishing in prison in Jerusalem during the siege of Babylon, wasn't explicitly talking about Jesus. He was talking about God's faithfulness, God's promise, and the unshakable hope therein. And he was speaking that promise to a people living in absolute darkness and chaos and hopelessness. Israel, the north and south part of the kingdom, sat on a trade route between two massive empires, and consequently, it was constantly in danger of being conquered, subjected, even destroyed, which is exactly what happened, as we know. After centuries of idolatry and oppressive practices of Judean kings and society's elite, God withdrew the divine protective power. Do you remember a couple weeks ago hearing about removing the hedge, the hedge of protection? And the unrelenting armies of Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. During that year of near constant attack, the citizens of Jerusalem were trapped. They were suffocating in a city that was rapidly running out of food and water, and even more rapidly acquiring sickness and disease. I mentioned a minute ago that uh, Jeremiah was in prison at this point. Yes, but not a Babylonian prison. He was incarcerated in his hometown, in Jerusalem, languishing in a prison attached to the palace of the besieged king. He was put there for angering his king by speaking God's truth to royal power. You see, kings and elites, he said, are crooked and corrupt. 
Their choices are affecting God's people negatively, Jeremiah preached. We are no longer functioning as a conduit of God's blessing in the world, he proclaimed. Therefore, things are going to go from bad to worse until the kingdom falls and we lose all power to Babylon. This kind of talk sounds like a great way to get yourself thrown in the clink. Powerful people do not appreciate this kind of bad press, fake news. But this is what prophets do. They speak truth to power, even at great personal risk. They name the realities of the world. They point to broken things and corruptions and injustices that are the root of suffering. They aren't psychics or fortune tellers about the future, but they do speak warnings about outcomes should things continue down a path of delinquency. Now it's not all bad news. Good prophets will also hold out a vision for people to cling to, even when its meaning is not yet able to be grasped. In the midst of chaos, Jeremiah proclaims both warnings and assurances. Things are going to get bad, he said, the worst we've ever seen. We are in dark days and darker ones are yet to come. Succeeding where Assyria had failed, Babylon would overthrow Jerusalem and the king and the whole upper echelon of society would be exiled, the rest left to languish. Nevertheless, Jeremiah said, God is faithful and has never forgotten God's promise of salvation and redemption for Israel. So even though it has a bushy tail and hops from branch to branch, we want to say it's Jesus, right? But what if we actually looked at what Jeremiah was doing and saying to his community in his lifetime in their context? What if we thought about what his earliest readers would have been hearing in his message while Babylon laid siege to their world? It would still be 500 years before that miraculous night in Bethlehem. So rather than Jesus, I'd wager to say that what Jeremiah was describing was a call to Advent. A call to wait for the light of God's promise during a period of great darkness. To a people caught up in the harsh realities of their present condition, Jeremiah points to hopeful expectation while waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. And isn't that what Advent is, after all? Waiting with bated breath, hopeful even in the face of a world that gives us every possible reason to feel hopeless. Babylon might not be knocking aggressively at our door, but we are feeling the threat of mounting climate crisis and the fallout of late-stage capitalism. We live in a time when school shootings are just regular occurrences now, and political polarization is hitting a fever pitch. A time where fear-mongering seems to be outweighing rational or even scientific thought. And the echo chambers of our social media lives validate our positions, regardless of facts or common sense. We live in a time and a place where some people own multiple multi-million dollar properties while a thousand kilometers north in the same province, other people barely survive without clean drinking water and the youth of their communities are on suicide watch. It's bonkers. It's just absurd. Yet in the midst of terror and fear and injustice and corruption, prophets call us to hold on to hope. A light shines in the darkness. God is faithful and will keep God's promises to the world, even to us, even today. Reading the prophets and wanting to quickly shout out, it's Jesus, is a bit like ignoring the obvious description of a squirrel during a children's message. It's like wanting to sing Christmas carols 
the minute we make it past Remembrance Day. Turn that was not directed at you. <laughs> this is what I have to work with. I'm going to try it again. It's like wanting to sing Christmas carols the minute we make it past Remembrance Day. Turn on the radio, open your computer, head to downtown or to the mall, and you're likely to be inundated with the holly jolly sights of Christmas. Twinkling lights and rosy-cheeked Santas adorn every space. Culture, you see, leaves no room for darkness or prayerful expectation. It resists sitting in the darkness. Maybe, this is a sermon for another day, Maybe it's because we can't quite make a commodity out of it yet. But you know what we can bottle and sell? Christmas. We skip right to the babe of Bethlehem, angel choirs and shepherds watching their flocks because we can breathe e easier then, like an analgesic against the pain of the world. The darkness of December rolls around and our world flips a switch to tinsel and carols because who wants to actually sit in the tension of Advent? To everyone who has ever uttered absurd, uh, the absurd idea that there is a war on Christmas, to you I say no friend, the war is on Advent. The war is on Advent. A complete repulsion and resistance to sitting in the darkness, waiting in hopeful anticipation of God's promises to be fulfilled. Our world of instant gratification, 24-hour-a-day Amazon deliveries, of hyper-commercialized, hyper-consumable holiday hides, it's Advent that gets squeezed out, ignored, and stuffed in the closet. Who needs Advent anyway? The church is called to observe Advent. I know you want Christmas. I do too. But the prophets have shown us what it means to hold out hope in the midst of darkness. And we have an obligation to follow suit. In Advent, the church proclaims an alternative reality that grows out of confidence in God's righteousness. The promise of God's righteousness both convicts and it makes new. Advent invites us to name the places in our lives and in society that are at odds with the divine vision of justice and righteousness. Because even though Jesus came 20 or 20 years ago, okay, math isn't my forte. Even though Jesus came 2,000 years ago, the world today in 2019 is still a mess. The season of Advent which is the start of our year as Christians, so Happy New Year, everyone, is a reminder that the world is still not as it ought to be. And so we actively wait in hopeful anticipation of God's promise, the final return of God's Messiah, the one who will set all things right, the one who will wipe every tear from our eyes, the one who will bring an end to war and disease and injustice and death, the one who will sit on the throne of heaven on earth for all of eternity. Advent reminds us that we are still waiting. And waiting is a spiritual discipline. Advent resists the urge to jump quickly to the answer, the part that feels good, that anesthetizes us to the pain and suffering in the world. Advent invites us to sit in the darkness, holding on to the small light of hope. Like exile, Advent invites us into the profound dissonance, the tension, the wide gap between the reality of what is and the promise of what will be. And isn't it just fitting then that we should celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper here at the doorway to Advent? Is it not the case that whenever we eat this bread and drink from this cup that we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection? 
until he comes again? We are fed at this table and spiritually nourished so that we can continue to hold fast to the hope that Christ will return, that the redemption of creation is most assuredly on its way. So welcome to Advent. Wait and hope. Resist heading to Bethlehem too soon. Yes, Christ has come, but Christ will come again. To God be all the glory. Amen.